Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Hope you could hear us. Hi, welcome to our webinar. I'm uh, Dr. Horn. I'm Dr. Lee with Infectious Disease. So today we'll be talking about wound care and antimicrobial stewardship. So this is a very good topic. So antimicrobial stewardship is what we love to talk about every day. Yeah. And wound care um, is a good topic for us to talk about. We haven't talked about wound care before. Um, and this is a good one to talk about uh, wound care kind of in general and infections in wound care, uh, antimicrobial stewardship in wound care. So we're really happy to be talking about this topic today. If you have any questions, um, so as you come in, uh, please mute yourself. And then if you have any questions at the end, we'll, we'll answer any questions, but you can also type in questions. Uh, you can go ahead and, and type in the question and, and we'll, uh, we'll address it as we go. So we're gonna start out talking about staging of pressure ulcers. We can't, can't get away without talking about uh, staging and kind of classification of pressure ulcers. So we'll discuss that and then kind of go from there. So here we have pressure. So pressure ulcers essentially are from putting high amount of pressure and, and more pressure that uh, uh, really impedes the blood flow. So muscle is more sensitive to compression than the skin. The deeper muscle tissue may be necrotic before damage to the overlying skin is apparent. So we'll, we'll see how the skin will kind of get, get red and you'll, you'll see there's evidence of a, uh, of a, uh, of a sore there, of a, of a superficial sore before you see really the sloughing and the ne necrosis yeah. start. So time and pressure. The normal response to prolonged pressure is Change, um, is a change in body position before tissue ischemia. So um, the pressure ulceration can result from one period of cystic pressure to over a long, prolonged period. But what I found kind of reading about this topic and learning more is that even low amount of pressure, but is sustained and repetitively occurring can cause a significant amount of pressure ulcer in our right. patients. And so this is why we move when we sleep. So if you just stay in the same position and you put Kind of pressure on the same location uh, for long periods of time so as we sleep we move around while we sleep so uh, so this doesn't happen from lying in the same position for long periods of time which makes sense for a lot of patients who have sacral ulcers you know even if we're using um, air mattress and such that small amount of pressure that's constantly being put on their sacral and other areas heals which is causing these ulcers for them so really to prevent pressure ulcers it's, it's really to uh, move the patient, so keep the patient moving so they're not on, on the same pressure points for prolonged periods of time. So I kind of think of this as when someone lies on a bed of nails. So if they're lying on a bed of nails, they have the pressure of, of the needle, of the nail, spread throughout uh, um, the whole bed of nails. But if you're just putting all of your pressure onto a nail, then, then that's when you have problems. Yeah, so. that spot, yeah. We want to kind of also touch base about different stages of ulcers to wounds. So stage one um, is when you have intact skin with non-blanchable redness of localized area, usually over a bony prominence. So if you guys look right here in this area, you know, when you have darker pigmentation, it sometimes be harder to see, but definitely there's injury to the superficial skin area right now in this picture. Right, and so stage one is just essentially the redness, um, non-blanchable, which means if you push it, it will stay red, uh, it won't blanch. Um, one way of doing that, people will talk about taking a slide or, or glass, and you can push on the patient's skin and see that uh, it doesn't blanch. But they also talk about uh, the tip of the iceberg. <clears throat> so if you see just a little bit of redness, it might be that there's a lot of necrosis under it that it will slough off over time. But just seeing a little bit of redness might mean there's a lot of badness underneath. We just haven't we just discovered haven't, it yet. Just haven't discovered it yet. No. So more pictures for stage one um, ulcers on the heel, um, on the thigh area, and this is your analogy tip. This of is it. the tip of the iceberg. So this this little redness right here is is a the analogy is that this, this iceberg here, but underneath you have all this necrosis that over time it will die and slough off. And so just seeing this little redness, so don't look at it and say, oh, that's just gonna be a little tiny sore. It yeah. could be actually very large. So treatment for stage one, remove the pressure 
do not rub or massage the prominence. Do not use donuts, um, you know, around, so sometimes that can't make it worse. Protect from moisture. Monitor the stage one so it's not progressing. Uh, no dressing required. Uh, treat pain if persistent. And you could put some barrier creams and such. But this is kind of what you want to do for starting with stage one um, wound. And then stage two. So partial thickness loss of the dermis presenting as a shallow open ulcer. So this one's open where the other stage one had intact skin. And you can see here it's, it's shiny. It's, it's a broken skin here. And stage two. So that it's similar to the other picture, except the skin is broken. And um, so that's stage two. Yeah, so that's stage two. So what do we do for stage two? So you, again, um, try to relieve the pressure keep the wound area clean, keep blisters intact if possible. I always think of blisters as like it's your, um, it's a band-aid on the underneath wound area. So keep it intact as possible. So it's acting like a natural band-aid. Cover with light dressing if ulcers open. Um, example, like non-adhering gauze dressing and change it every day. And blisters, blisters can happen from tension on the skin. So tension on the skin, so if you have skin and you put tension, so that you have uh, essentially pulling of the skin, you can get the blisters. Oftentimes when see, people see blisters, if the blisters look bad, people will think, oh my gosh, could this be neck fash? When really it could be just tension on the skin. So sometimes when, um, especially after surgery or if someone has tape, um, uh, a bandage with tape, just having that tension on the skin can cause the blisters to form. So it doesn't necessarily mean there's an infection there if you have blisters. Um, also, when patients with heart failure, their, their legs expand and it's pulling on the skin, they can get a lot of blisters there. doesn't yeah. mean there's an infection necessarily. Venous stasis, edema yeah. with heart failure, you could get a lot. We, we see a lot of those patients with blisters right. because there's so much fluid overload. And, and so sometimes people will consult us specifically for the blisters. Yeah. When the blisters may or may not relate to infection. Yeah. So occasionally I see blisters that are infected, you know, mm -hmm. you could see purulence draining mm -hmm. yellow, but for the most part, um, you know, treat it like a stage two and like light covering, relieve mm -hmm. the pressure and just take care of the wound itself. I don't, you know, we don't need to start attacking with antimicrobials if we don't see infection. Um, next is stage three. So full thickness tissue loss. So as you guys could see here, the there's deeper into the tissue of the wound, but we haven't gotten through the um, fat to the bone yet. So it's full right. thickness tissue. Right, so there's no bone, tendon, and the muscle's not exposed. So it's just the, the tissue there. <clears throat> so there's some stage three, it's the tissue. And so um, if you can probe, you're, you're just essentially going to, to get the uh, soft tissue here. So with all of these, it's remove pressure. Removing pressure is really the key to preventing and, and having it heal up, allowing it to get good blood flow. And good blood flow is, uh, you know, when it comes to infections as well, having good blood flow is, is really important for the body to heal up and, and eliminate infections and, and uh, fix itself. Eliminate the slough. So, you know, on the wound, if you have a lot of necrotic debris and slough, um, try to do some... Um, debridement, enzymatic or autolytic or shock debridement, depending on what's available and either a surgeon or if you, if you guys have wound care, um, you know, to be able to clean that area, manage the exudate um, and then monitor for infection and then treat the pain. So as we get, um, we're going to talk a little bit more as we get deeper into the stages, it's when you have higher risk of getting infection. And stage four, so this is full thickness with exposed bone, tendon, or muscle. And so in this picture, you can see it points out the bone. Sometimes it's hard to see, and that's why they need to take a, a probe and kind of push in there, or you put a glove on and stick your hand in there. And it you looks can like the, bone, the bone right there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, also <clears> in <throat> infectious disease, um, we, you know, if there's infection present, and then we see bone exposed, we automatically assume it's an osteomyelitis. Yeah, and with all of these, really the key is offloading and having the patient um, eat enough proteins and, and eating enough so that they can heal themselves up. Yeah, nutrition is key. Right, I think there's a, a test question where you go into the patient's room and they have pressure sores, and then 
in the <clears throat> in the question, it mentions that there are candy bar wrappers all over and chip bags of chips. And so in, in test questions, you're supposed to realize, oh, that yeah. they have bags of chips and candy bars. They're, maybe their diet is not what it should be yeah. to, to heal up. Yeah, I think like, you know, with wound care, um, uh, it's a multidisciplinary approach. You know, you have to have your primary care doctor, your wound care specialist, you know, your mm -hmm. plastic surgeon, orthopedic surgeon, or podiatry. But I also think having our nutritionist to be part mm -hmm. of that team to make sure we are optimizing nutrition and having proper protein intake to be able to heal these wounds are really important too. So yes, it's a exactly. multidisciplinary way of taking care of it. Exactly, making sure they get enough protein to heal yeah. up is, is a big part of it. Sometimes, you know, the, some of the misconception is, oh, can't you give some antibiotics and make <laughs> it, but it's, it, antibiotics alone is not going to be able to help. So here are more pictures of stage four. And so this goes through the skin layers, tissue, muscle, all the way to the bone. And so here's a picture of the bone is exposed. And here, this is another deep, uh, deep wound with exposure to the bone. So remove pressure, eliminate slough or eschar. So if there's any, anything dead, essentially, needs to be removed. Otherwise, it can't continue to heal. Manage the exudate, treat the pain, and monitor for infection. So this is when you worry about osteomyelitis, mm -hmm. sepsis, uh, cellulitis, abscess. So in this case, you know, we got to give them the right antimicrobials for the right duration to be able to heal. Right. And when there's uh, osteomyelitis, the bone will be soft and like, uh, can easily be scraped away. And so when they debride, they'll want to scrape it away to get to the, the hard, bleeding, healthy bone. Yeah. And we always talk to the surgeons to be yeah. able to ask, and you know, <clears throat> do we get clean margins? And were we able to get rid of all the infected bone? Because that changes the duration of treatment. If you still have infected bone, lot prolonged treatment versus if you don't have infected bone, you just treat the soft tissue infection. And here's unstageable pressure ulcers. So unstageable is essentially there's slough. Um, and Eshkar, and you can't tell just by looking, so you need to kind of debride and kind of scrape out the slough. And, yeah, and, and, and so if you start here, you're not really sure, and then they're able to debride a little bit more, and it's it's a more of a superficial wound that they're seeing. Mm -hmm. And some of the debridement can be done at bedside, mm -hmm. some needs to be done in the OR. That's, uh, we leave that up to the surgeon. Yeah. So again, remove pressure, that's the theme. Eliminate slough and Eshkar, uh, restage once all the, the slough and the eschar, the scabbing has been removed. Manage the exudate, monitor in, for infection, and treat the pain. Monitor infection, it's, it's harder than it sounds because yeah. you look at it, it's hard to tell if it's actually infected or not, but we'll talk more about that. Yeah. So we wanted to kind of get into the four steps of wound healing. So first is hemostasis. So you have a, a wound and now you have the fibrin clot and you know you might have some bacteria kind of landing, but you have the fiber and clot. You have um, you know good um, blood vessels that are supplying good blood, um, blood to the area. So the second process is is inflammation. So um, right, so the capillaries become leaky. You have, you essentially send out uh, your immune system to heal it up. Uh, inflammation and then proliferation. It it uh, essentially continues. To pro proliferate and heal up, and then restoration. So you get lots of oh, blood and vessels, angiogenesis, right. lots <clears throat> of blood vessels, and you're healing through underneath. And then last is restoration, where your wound is nicely healed and remodeled. And so this is this is good. So these are the same four stages. At the top here, you have the uh, hemostasis, inflammatory phase, <clears throat> and then the, the normal wound healing goes to the left, the proliferation phase and, and maturation. And then if you have a chronic wound, you get excessive inflammation and microbial colonization and gangrene. So excessive inflammation that essentially gets stuck in that phase and doesn't continue to heal. And this is kind of what happens to our diabetic foot ulcers. Um, you know, you are not getting good blood supply. A lot of them, a lot of our patients mm -hmm. have, you know, elevated hemoglobin A1C, uncontrolled sugars, peripheral vascular disease. So that inflammatory mm -hmm. process is not get, letting us heal to go to the normal phase. We're stuck in this phase. Right. And with these, these patients with the diabetic feet, so again, their feet are getting infected because of the poor blood supply. Mm -hmm. And then we'll have vascular surgeons come in and evaluate the blood supply because if the blood supply is extremely poor, they don't have pulses in their foot, they're not getting um, uh, a good 
essentially the vascularization of yeah. blood supply, they won't be able to heal up. Even with antibiotics, they won't heal. Yeah. Their... And what sometimes like gets even more complicated is you have a diabetic patient with elevated hemoglobin A1C, peripheral vascular disease, mm -hmm. and they're smoking. Yes, they continue to smoke. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and then, so we're just stuck in these two phases where we cannot get over here to heal. Yes, I've had patients with osteo of, of their, their feet, and we've given antibiotics for weeks and weeks. I think we gave two or three months of antibiotics, and it continued to just do poorly. And they got revascularized. The vascular surgeon went in and uh, put a stent in, mm -hmm. and to improve the blood supply, they had pulses. Within about a, two weeks or so, it looked great. Yeah. It just, yeah. I mean, the, the uh, antibiotics could get there, yeah. the, the immune system could get there. So it, it's just really, if they don't have a good blood supply, it's not going to heal up. And then microbes and chronic wounds. So all chronic wounds are contaminated. <clears throat> so we'll talk about contamination. Essentially, that's bacteria that's there that uh, may not be replicating, but it's, it's there on the site. How do you know when a wound is infected? Some of the signs. So you have increased exudate, a lot of um, drainage, exudate, swelling, irritable around the wound and ar around the skin area, definitely increased pain. And then you could have increased local temperature. So usually what I like to do is actually I put gloves on and I like to feel around the wound mm -hmm. area because it tells a lot yeah. by touching the wound area because uh, sometimes um, you could tell if it's hot and you know, so I think physical exam is very important and then um, And then also looking for ascending infection cellulitis and the others, right? This is your rubor, galore, color. Yes yeah. So I we really like this picture because mm -hmm. um, we want you to kind of, to kind of think of this as your wound bed and you know initially um, all our skins if I take a swab and culture it, we all have bacteria and it's normal. We all have lots of gram positive bacteria on our skin. So initially you just get contamination. And then these bacteria on that wound can start slowly multiplying, but they're still just hanging out on the top, like colonization is what we call it. But then sometimes in this wound, these bacteria that are hanging out can just continue to proliferate and, you know, cause more exudate, but you're still not infected. But then infection starts, you know, usually in the stage four, stage three or four of the wound uh, stages, where now the bacteria starts getting into the actual skin and deeper. Right, and a lot of people, so talk about the gut microbiome, and this is very similar. So just on our skin, we have uh, kind of its own microbiome with mm -hmm. some bacteria that is good and, and is, uh, is healthy. And so with wounds, <clears throat> it's kind of the same thing. They have uh, bacteria that's, that's there that's gonna be like coagulator staph and beer dance group strep that is actually thought to be a good thing. So if it's growing there and then, and the kind of the, the thought is that if you have something land, if you have MRSA land, it may not be able to uh, start growing there. So it's like having a very thick forest and then you're throwing a seed. It may not grow because there's already so much flora there so there's already so many the good guys trees. are there the, the good, the good <laughs> yeah. trees are there right yeah so it may not land and grow but if you give antibiotics and you wipe out the good bacteria or decrease the good bacteria just like in your gut yeah. then then if the mrsa lands it has more of a chance to grow with nothing yeah. impeding it nothing getting in its way and it's the same kind of idea with um uh urinary tract infections as well i mean we talk about gut but urinary tract infections after giving someone antibiotics for a urinary tract infection, <clears throat> they're actually at increased risk More. for a short time to get a, a, and it's because you wiped out their good bacteria and you're having new bacteria that's kind of growing out of control. So this is a really nice picture to keep in mind. And then we kind of want to do a dive a little <clears throat> deeper. Yes, so this is contaminated or colonized. So if you look at this wound, and, and it's kind of uh, hard to tell sometimes with wounds, is it infected or not? Is it just contaminated or colonized. So bacteria present on the wound surface, so it's contaminated. All wounds are considered contaminated. A steady state of replicating organisms uh, but aren't associated with tissue damage or delayed healing is colonization. So, so you could see right yeah. here like really good granulation tissue. Mm -hmm. You could see some yellow sloughing, but you know, overall good granulation tissue, red, it's 
you know, it's in the process of trying to heal. Yeah, so that looks good. So it's, it's sometimes hard to tell, but this one, if you look at it, if possible, wouldn't start antibiotics mm -hmm. when you see a wound. Uh, and if you're not sure, it's kind of hard to hold off, but that's what we try to do. Yeah, and this is where I think having a wound care of yes. um, nursing staff and a surgery staff to help us keep the wound clean and continue to kind of heal that. And then critically colonized. So the bacterial burden in the wound is increasing, uh, initiating an immune response. So you're getting inflammation. Um, it's no longer healing at the expected rate. It may be taking longer than expected. Uh, and then there's this uh, acronym NERDS that we're not going to get into, uh, but uh, it's there to kind of help remember what to, uh, uh, what to think about when you think of infections. And that's erythema, redness, um, uh, some bleeding, uh, these kinds of things. <clears throat> And then here um, we have an infected wound. So if you see here, it's still around the wound. Yes, you have sloughing, you, you know, purel and discharge, but it's still in the colonization, critically colonized phase. But when you come here is when you're actually seeing infected wound with surrounding cellulitis. So bacteria are present within the wound and have spread to develop surrounding um, tissue, um, uh, multiplying, causing tissue damage. There's associated host inflammatory response. Um, and the wound is painful uh, and maybe increase in size with potential satellite lesions and outbreaks and look for signs of outline in the um, navel or another acronym stones. And this, this redness, <clears throat> so when you look at it, this, it's very apparent because it's, it's red compared to the surrounding tissues. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's hard to tell, but um, uh, if, if you touch it and it's warm mm -hmm. and it's, it's tender, it's a light touch if they have feeling there, those are th some of the clues that kind of help. Yeah. So if it's warm, it's tender, just a light touch, just a light touch on the skin, uh, more likely signs of infection. So in here and here, you can probably just get away with not keeping the wound clean. nice and clean yes. and wound yeah. care. But here is when you start thinking about uh, on top of wound care and keeping the wound clean, we need to add antimicrobials. So, yeah, and this is a good picture. So on the right, it has microbial progression. So you can see the top, it has contamination and then colonization and then critical colonization and then at the bottom, infection. So systemic antibiotics are needed. So <clears throat> really, I think one of the best ways, really what the books say, well, the best way to tell if it's infected is to take a sample of the tissue and then have it <clears throat> send it to pathology and they can look and see if there's bacteria in, invading the tissue and, and getting into the tissue. But that's, nobody. Uh, nobody does that. Yeah. Nobody does that. But I mean, really that's the best for, yeah. for any type of infection anywhere in the body. If yeah. you can show invasion, um, invasion of the tissue. So like, I, I really like also this graph, it, you know, how the progression of different types of bacteria too. So if you have contamination, for the most part, it's gram positive bacteria, like we talked about our skin flora. And then when you have more colonization, you, again, you have mostly gram positive. Here you could start having a little bit more gram negatives too, if they E. coli or, um, you know, uh, a club CL or something like that, they could hop on, but it's not, still, you don't need to give antibiotic, it's still wound care. But as it progresses more critical colonization, this is when, um, you know, you have gram positive, gram negatives, anaerobes, so there's more bacterial burden and uh, different types of bacteria present. And then when you have definite infection, you know, further down, when we have deep wounds like um, that we just showed earlier, here is when you want to kind of cover for like gram negative and positive to make sure you're covering widely until you get tissue culture or deep culture. Right, and, and the recommendation is if you see someone with a wound, if someone comes in with a pressure sore and you look at it, the recommendation is not to swab it unless you think there's an infection. Mm -hmm. If you swab it, it's kind of like a urinary tract yeah. infection. You, if you do swab it, it's with the intent to treat. Yeah. It's, so sometimes people will say, well, I just wanted to swab it to see how it's going. I wouldn't recommend doing that yeah. or to see what, what's growing there. I wouldn't recommend doing that unless it, it looks infected. So it, it has purulence. It may have a foul odor. Um, and you look at it and you say, that's in fact I want to treat. And if possible, I would recommend taking a swab and then waiting on the swab to get see what, what returns instead of 
uh, giving multiple antibiotics one after another. So. And then um, I always think of um, this as well when you guys, you know, if it's superficial wound, wound care is the best thing. But when you have deep wounds and you're worried about infection, yeah. when you do swab, um, for me, you're still going to grow a lot of things when you swab because you have all these colonizations that we were talking about. So for me, if I do that, my if I do end up getting results for that, if I have Staph aureus, MRSA or MSSA, then for me, 50% of the time, studies show that is the culprit. So you don't have to worry about the rest of them around. If you have Staph aureus, 50% of the time, that is what's causing that infection. So just targeting that. That's a really good point. So if, if Staph aureus grows, whether it's MRSA or MSSA, and then you also have <coughs> coagulative staph, and you also have enterococcus. So that was yeah. too. You also have yeah. enterococcus and all these things. It becomes difficult to cover everything. Yes. So if you just go with the main player, just with staph aureus, they'll they'll peel up. And one of the questions we always get is about enterococcus, um, mm -hmm. uh, and I always tell people um, enterococcus. Um, it's kind of like they just hang out. It's very, yep. they can cause infection if like bacteremia, intra-abdominal infection sometimes, but in, especially on diabetic wound, chronic wound, they just hang out with the other players. They're just long for the ride. Yeah. yeah. So you don't, I would focus on the other players than the enterococcus. Right. And this, when they do swab it, they will send it for aerobic culture. So they won't swab it and send it for anaerobic culture. And the reason is because when they swab it and it, it's already exposed to air, so when they swab it, if they if you do a swab for anaerobes, as soon as you bring it out of the wound and expose the air, it, it will kill it and die. And so it, the, the yield will be very poor. So our uh, microbiology lab won't do anaerobes unless it's coming from a body fluid. Mm -hmm. The wound may smell very bad. Um, and you if it smells bad, we treat for anaerobes. Um, so but I, it's <laughs> hard to grow things from anaerobes. So I, I went to, a few years ago, I went to Paris with my wife. <laughs> and we went to a cheese store and where they had all these different cheeses and it smelled like a, a, a chronic wound. It smelled like a disgusting wound to me and I had to leave the cheese store because you are really <laughs> exciting all of us to go to Paris. Yes, everyone's gonna have no nobody's gonna eat cheese anymore. You're actually at Infectious Disease Society of America, there's a book uh, that I saw once that had all these anaerobes. And all the different types of cheeses with how their colony count of all the different oh, wow. anaerobes. And they're the same anaerobes that are in wounds. So wow. I'm exciting everyone <laughs> to talk about to eat eat uh, cheese today. eat eat cow smelling cheese, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, that's funny. And next is microbiology of our wounds. So in summary, chronic wounds um, have many gram positive organisms. Wounds of several month duration with deep structure and involvement on average have four to five microbial pathogens, so lot, including gram negatives. So long-term chronic wounds and, and more anaerobes than aerobes. So they'll have a lot of anaerobes there. And then aerobic gram negative rods also infect wounds. So you'll have all sorts of things. <clears throat> and then things that are found in water, pseudomonas, Athenetobacter, Stenotrophomonas. Um, so these are things that if you found them, you would target them. So if you had a lot of coag negative staph and enterococcus, but if you found Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter, um, these are things that are kind of more virulent. Or yeah. They, you want to target. Uh, these are like the pathogenic <coughs> organism. If you found it in a superficial wound that is, um, you know, that you could do wound care, that's fine. But when these organisms, when you find them, when they're in their third or fourth stage, really infected wounds, we have to target them and they can get sometimes get tricky. And then here we have a little bit, of, I just want to touch on biofilms. So <clears throat> low oxygen biofilm niches. So when you have uh, biofilms, biofilms are essentially an extracellular matrix. So the cells will produce this kind of matrix and kind of spit it out all around it. Um, and it'll be kind of like um, this kind of goo, this kind of snot here. So it'll send it out. And then if you look at the pictures down here, the attachment. So the bacteria will be like in the blood or in the wound and will attach and make this extracellular matrix. And the thing that's interesting about this is that this is the same uh, extracellular matrix that's uh, on teeth. This is why we brush our, brush our teeth. It's the same thing that's in our pipes at home. So when our pipes get clogged, they're actually bacteria that are sticking to the walls and, and growing. And usually when people think about bacteria, they think that the bacteria is out 
uh, out for itself. So the bacteria, uh, they're all independent of each other, but they're actually talking to each other. And so they, they build kind of these condominiums, right? <laughs> this, this growth in this, in this picture here, it, it's kind of like building a skyscraper and they actually have pathways. It will have pathways for the, the blood or the fluid like uh, in a lake, the, the fluids to come in, get the nutrients, and then has pathways for the, uh, the garbage <laughs> the, to flow away from it. So it's actually structured in a way that they're talking to each other. So it's actually quite interesting. So and biofilms, <coughs> but we also struggle on like central lines and foliage, yes. you know, and hardware. But also biofilm is present in our wound. So it's important to know. And sometimes that's why it's, you know, when we work with our wound care uh, staff, like the superficial, when you mm -hmm. wipe off that biofilm and then just doing wound care and not, you don't have to do antibiotics, you know? Right, and they get this biofilm, it makes it impenetrable to antibiotics. And so just wiping it off, yeah. just keeping it clean and dry is very important. Oh, and breakpoints, this is a good, uh, a good topic as well. So when we look at breakpoints, when we read the susceptibility report, <clears throat> I would only look at, is it susceptible or not susceptible? And the reason we asked, uh, talking about this is because <clears throat> we get a lot of questions. Can we use Doxy versus Bactrim versus Linazolid, you know, mm -hmm. if you have a cellulitis or wound? And then sometimes, you, um, you know, there's question like this one has the lowest MIC. Yes, amikacin has the lowest M, uh, okay. MIC. Should I use amikacin or gentamicin? No, if, if it says susceptible or Keflex, then just use Keflex, yeah. that would be great. But you can't compare one to another. So each one is individualized. So you can't compare Keflex with uh, amikacin, with uh, linazolid. Just you look at the one that you want to, to use. And then if it says susceptible and the patient doesn't have any drug allergies and it's uh, appropriate for, their, for that patient, then that's the one I would go with. Yeah, uh, and you know, that's why like in, especially for in treating wounds, because majority of the wounds are gram positive, we mm -hmm. have a lot of gram positive options. You know, you have Bactrim, Caflex, um, you know, Clindamycin, if you want to use it, make sure you think about C. diff, but um, you know, Doxycycline. So there's a lot of options for our gram positive, especially for Staph aureus or MS. MSSA, MRSA, but I think knowing the MIC and knowing if it's susceptible, mm -hmm. and then, um, and I, you know, one of the questions I always get is like, you know, you have a 70 year old patient with a wound infection, with staph aureus infection, um, and then, uh, you know, should we do doxy or bathroom? And my um, pick always is let's do doxy because, you know, mm -hmm. in the elderly patients over the age of 65, I try to avoid Bactrim because of kidney mm -hmm. functions and such. So it's like individualizing for that patient. And then this is good too. So, <clears throat> so this, when we look at narrow spectrum versus broad spectrum versus extended versus restricted. So if possible, we'd always want to go with the narrowest uh, spectrum. Now, with wounds, if sometimes patients have wounds for a long time and they'll continue to get antibiotics over and over and over again, so, and they'll develop resistance. And so that's why we try to give the most narrow spectrum one we can for that patient instead of using broad spectrum over and over because sometimes they'll get so much resistance that we don't have any more options uh, for PO and they have to go to IV. And then sometimes we run out of options IV. Um, so, and as far as restricted antibiotics, when you order a susceptibility, you, you do a swab and you send it to uh, get a susceptibility report, not all of the antibiotics that work will be shown. And so the reason is because, uh, for instance, if linazolid, if it's susceptible to linazolid, the clinicians will look and they'll say, oh, linazolid works, that's a good PO option, we'll use that. And so instead of giving something IV while the patient's in the hospital, they'll get PO linazolid um, or something that is kind of a third line, fourth, fourth line, line antibiotic. Yeah, so like, you know, if you have a wound and then let's say clinically patient is stable and the wound is growing MRSA, you have, you know, your Bactrim, you have your Doxy that works really well. 
Um, you could use Clinda, but you want to make sure it's susceptible because, um, you know, with clindamycin, um, 50% of MRSA are resistant now. But, you know, but your Bactrim and Doxy for MRSA works really well. So um, you don't have to dump it linazolid. So some, you know, some of our hospitals and working with the microbiology, we report susceptibility in a way that you pick the least mm -hmm. important drug so you don't get susceptibility to linazolid or adapter when you have a susceptible MRSA. Right, and so that's called suppression. Yeah. <clears throat> so the, the micro lab will suppress those results. So when I talk to people, oftentimes they'll say, oh, they didn't test daptomycin or they didn't test linazolid. And most of the time they do test it, but they don't show it. Yeah. And uh, so if you have a patient that's, that has a, uh, an allergy to cephalosporins or penicillins and cephalosporins and things that they can't take uh, the first line, second line, then you need to call the lab and ask them. Yeah, and um, and this is part of the antimicrobial stewardship part. Mm -hmm. You know, the lab working with um, you know the antimicrobial stewardship team to kind of make sure we're using antimicrobial properly. But then, in in certain circumstances, you could call the lab and ask for the mm -hmm. other susceptibilities. Oh, diabetic foot and ulcer, <clears throat> and this is superficial to deep. So, how deep is this wound? Um, now. Uh, one thing that with diabetic foot ulcers, um, there's a special case. I don't, I don't know if we get into it too much, but it's a, uh, a nail through a shoe. And that's specifically um, a buzzword for pseudomonas. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good point. So if you have any type of nail that goes through the shoes, it's the moisture that was on the shoe mm -hmm. that got um put into the in, internal tissue, then you have to treat for pseudomonas. But if you have a wound like this starting off, superficial wound, you could just do <clears throat> just wound care. Yes. Even no. here, you could just do wound care and local treatment. But when you get here, when you have bone involvement, this, this is when we know we need um, IND, possible, you know, taking out some of the infected bone. Patient might need, um, if there's still infected bone left, patient might need four to six weeks of antimicrobials. Um, so this is when we have to have the prolonged duration of therapy and right. follow up. And, and for all of these patients, really, uh, success also depends on uh, good uh, uh, diabetes control, yes. which you mentioned earlier, yes. stopping smoking, which you yes. mentioned earlier. A good wound care, looking at it every yeah. day, caring for it. Yeah. So, because um, you know, we wanted to kind of focus a little bit on diabetic foot because you know this comes up a lot. So, most diabetic foot infections are polymicrobial. So, just like we talked about before, you have a lot of colonization with lots of different um, bacteria. Uh, staph is common, and aerobic gram-negative bacilli are frequently a co-pathogen. So, you know, E. coli or Pseudomonas, you could find and anaerobes can be found as well in necrotic ischemic wound. Um, you know, um, so sometimes when we walk into a patient room and they have diabetic foot infection, um, you could smell the anaerobic. So, you know, the wound um, is ischemic, necrotic, and so you want to do a little bit broader coverage to cover for those anaerobes as well. So, you know, if you just think of gram positive, you might just start with Keflex. But if it's a necrotic wound, you might start with, you know, that is um, <clears throat> stable but necrotic augmentin for a little bit more anaerobic coverage. Yes, and uh, one question we get with this, if it's uh, a bone infection there, you have osteomyelitis, people say, oh, it's a bone infection, I need IV antibiotic. And there's actually a lot of evidence. Um, there's actually more evidence that PO antibiotics work for osteo than IV. Yes. And there's more evidence. And the reason is because they'll check PO antibiotics and it'll work. And they'll say, well, that can't be. And they'll yeah. do it again. And they'll say, well, that's weird. It worked again. And they'll keep doing it yeah. until you have just a mountain of evidence showing that PO antibiotics work well. Yeah. For, so a lot of times what I do now, and I'm sure you do as well, for diabetic foot, um, you know, osteomyelitis, deep infection, I just use oral antibiotics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when only time that I get into IV therapies, you know, if you have spinal bone, you know, discitis, or like some deep bone infection that I want to treat, but or joint infection. But if you have a diabetic foot ulcer, um, uh, we are comfortable treating them with oral antimicrobial. Mm -hmm. So it works well. You just have to, some of the things that you could follow are sed rates. If mm -hmm. it's elevated, it's helpful. And then treat them for four to six weeks and keep a very close eye on the patient. Yes, the only exception, so I will use so these, uh, the pictures that we just showed. <coughs> I would use PO antibiotics 
Now, if there's a chance that um, uh, if the wound looks really bad and the foot looks really bad, if it's limb threatening, I would use IV. Yes, definitely. So if they say, we're going to try it for a couple weeks and if it doesn't work, we're going to take it off, I would do IV. Yeah, then you could always, another option is start off with IV for a couple of weeks yes. and then step down to oral therapy. Yes, once there's a clear improvement, go down to PO. So I wanted to make that one exception yeah, because if it definitely. were my foot, I, I would say, yes. I would do the same thing. I would use PO, but if they say, you know, yeah. we're, we're, we're thinking about taking it off, I would yeah. say, let's try the IV, yes. give it a shot, and then take it off. So a simple one, <laughs> oral, if it's complicated, yeah. definitely IV. Right, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to just skip over, but mm -hmm. one thing I wanted to kind of um, highlight is in diabetic foot infection, if it's a deep wound, um, uh, X-ray might be okay, but MRI is more yep. sensitive and specific to detect osteomyelitis. Um, and then having a team approach, you know, um, ha as highlighted here, having the primary care doctor, mm -hmm. podiatrist, orthopedic surgeon, PTOT to offload wound care, and then a vascular surgeon. It's a team approach to be able to help heal that patient's wound and nutritionist. And then we'll just touch on this study. This is Kind of the cutting edge. This is what's um, happening in infectious disease when it comes to osteomyelitis and pressure sores. So with pressure sores, in the past they would say if it goes to bone 100% have uh, osteo and need antibiotics. But kind of the, the newer thing is that they're showing that if someone has, especially in really large uh, pressure sores that are that are uh, very large with a lot of overlying tissue is 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 gone, that if, if you say that if the bone is showing, and it's definitely osteo, it needs six weeks of antibiotics. Well, if they give six weeks of antibiotics, oftentimes if there's a lot of tissue that's, that's missing, the bone will still be exposed after six weeks. And then they say, well, what do we do now? Because the bone is still exposed. So there are patients that frequently get treated for six weeks, go home, come back uh, a couple months later, and the bone is still exposed, and they get it treated again. And then, and then they get another six weeks, and then couple months later, come back in and get another six weeks. So really, this last sentence here, no evidence of benefit of antibiotics without concomitant surgical debridement and wound coverage. So uh, if they have exposed bone, really, ideally, you would have a flap or you'd have something to cover it. And when the flap is done, I, I will cover for anaerobes as well for um, a broad spectrum with anaerobic coverage as well for a little while because you're trapping a lot of anaerobes in there and everything. Um, until the flap, until the yeah. flap takes uh, definitely works, you know. Um, definitely uh, cover for anaerobe broadly until the flap works. It takes a while, and another way to also kind of keep this covered is wound back. Mm -hmm. um, and then once you have better closure, then flap afterwards. But I think again, multidisciplinary approach and getting mm -hmm. your plastic surgery um, involved and kind of working together with wound care to be able to help right. these patients. So if there's a patient that is not going to get surgery and it doesn't look, it may not look infected at all. <clears throat> you might look and say, well, it looks bad, but it's been like that for the last two years. Yeah. Let's just leave it as it is. And um, then just maintain wound care. Right, instead of cycling antibiotics. Yeah. Right. Because we have so many patients that we treat over and over again um, that, that they don't get the flap and then it doesn't get better. So this is one of our newest guidelines from Infectious Disease Society. Right, and, and how is the osteomyelitis diagnosed? So um, when, in the study, they actually looked at MRI versus biopsy. So an MRI, it might light up, but the MRI is showing edema, right? Edema in the bone. And so it couldn't distinguish uh, remodeling of the bone and that edema from getting uh, uh, essentially leaky capillaries mm -hmm. and, 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 and healthy remodeling versus osteomyelitis. And even if they did have osteomyelitis, oftentimes it was just on the kind of the outer side, the cortical bone and not the medullary bone. And so if they have osteomyelitis just kind of on the outside of the bone for a long time and it doesn't continue to progress, then it might be okay just to kind of leave yeah. them alone, right? Then usually um, they found no data to support antibiotic duration greater than six weeks in this setting. And some authors recommend two weeks of therapy if osteomyelitis is limited to the cortical bone. So usually six weeks with wound closure at, or wound back and working as a team. And that's what we have for today. All right. So if there are any questions, we'd be happy to uh, answer any questions that you have. Sorry, um, we went over a little bit. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, so our next uh, webinar 
is going to be on RSV and viral infections um, that especially are prominent in the winter time along with uh, influenza. Uh, if you have any topics for us that you'd like to cover, please email us uh, and we'd be happy to cover them. If you have any questions, you could text us or Okay. All right. So if anyone has any questions, we'd be happy to, um, you know, just send us an email and we'll get back to you. Uh, but thank you very much for, for attending Joining our webinar. Us. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Yep. Thank you. Dr. Horn.